Great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's just a couple minutes past two. And um, if, uh, yeah, if everyone wants to go ahead and mute yourself, uh, you're welcome to have your videos on or off. For me, it's kind of fun to have the video because I can uh, see whether you're interested or not. <laughs> um, and then also, um, I will not be monitoring the chat, so you can chat with each other, but if you have a question, please just unmute yourself and ask me the question or ask the question to the group. Um, and we also have a small enough group that, um, you know, I'm happy for you to bring questions to the table as you have them um, or clarifications. So um, with that, I will um, get started. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so here's today's agenda. We're going to be covering um, a lot of different topics um, and there's all sorts of little gems in each of them. So, um, and it will take uh, the full hour and a half. Um, so let's get started. And if there's any technical difficulties, uh, just let me know. Okay, so why cover crop? When I speak with growers in our region, and when I say our region, I'm talking about Yolo, Solano, Sacramento, <clears throat> three things really jump out. The soil health, plant health program, reasons for adding nitrogen to the soil, um, and suppressing winter weeds. <laughs> There's all sorts of other benefits, but these really rise to the top. And when we think about the soil structure component, we're focused on thinking about reducing compaction. And this has uh, some economic benefits, which can translate into reducing uh, fuel use during tillage, um, increasing water infiltration, increasing, increasing water holding capacity, and increasing the soil organic matter. And some of those overlap, right? The soil structure and soil organic matter, uh, improving those water features. Nitrogen. So it can go both ways, right? Your cover crops can add nitrogen and they can also help capture residual nitrogen from the previous crop. This often isn't the case um, as frequently in organic production. Um, but in any case, if there is there, these uh, crops serve to mop it up, take it up into their biomass and then make it available for the springtime and beyond. And it also becomes this uh, food source for the microbes, right? And then they become part of this nitrogen release uh, through the soil organic matter into the uh, growing season. And suppressing winter weeds, right? This is a choice of growing these cover crops in lieu of growing winter weeds with that winter rain. So this is a um, graphic that we recently put together that I think captures nicely these contributions um, in a nitrogen budget for an organic system. So on the bottom here in the sort of darker ground, brown green color, that's the soil organic matter. And that's releasing tremendous amounts of nitrogen on an ongoing basis in the background. And these cover crops are adding to that. Uh, in the first year, as we'll see, we're not going to get a lot of nitrogen from that cover crop. We're going to get 4 to 35 percent of the total nitrogen that was in that crop in the first year. And so where is the rest of that nitrogen going? It's going towards building the uh, soil organic matter, which will become a great bank of nitrogen release. Can you guys see my cursor moving um, on the screen? Maybe yes. Someone. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so then here in the middle with the light green, we've got the cover crop and followed by a manure or I mean, sorry, a compost of sorts, a granular fertilizer and up at the top irrigation. So when you look at the whole nitrogen plan for an organic operation, this cover crop piece is a big one. So the immediate benefits um, in like a one year time frame. Uh, you are going to be able to see some of these nitrogen benefits in the first year. If there's residual nitrate uh, in the soil, these cover crops can take it up. Legumes can take it up, um, reduce it by 23%. You'll see the grasses, right? They have a much larger uh, root structure and deeper root structure. 
It'll be taking up more at 60%. And even brassicas are up as high as the grasses. Uh, providing early sources of nectar and pollen. This is a really wonderful component to um, the cover crops. So when organic operations are relying on these beneficial insects to do a fair amount of um, pest management, getting those slower growing populations established earlier by providing these earlier sources of nectar and pollen is really uh, wonderful and important. And then putting carbon back into the soil. So this is going to feed the microbes and the microbes become this engine below the soil for the ongoing nutrient release, especially um, uh, nitrogen, but of course they're doing all sorts of other benefits uh, as well. And then just physically keeping the soil covered and protecting it against those elements, especially in the winter, we've got rain and wind. In the springtime, we have more wind and also just sun. So creating this cover so we can keep our quality soil in place uh, is really key. So here's some research from uh, Eric Brennan, who's a USDA researcher uh, in Salinas. And he's been doing these long-term cover crop research um, studies. And so this first one we're looking at, on the bottom here in red, you can see that this is no compost and cover cropping every fourth year. And we're looking at the buildup of organic matter or the contribution of organic matter. So pretty low when you're not adding compost and only cover cropping every uh, fourth winter. We look to the next one up and that's a yellow in yellow. And there we see a big jump in the organic matter input. And that's largely coming from the compost because that yellow one is compost every year, but the rye legume cover crop only every fourth year. And then you see a slight but significant increase in organic matter when you then cover crop every year. So what this is saying is that the cover crops are adding to the organic matter in a significant way. But that cover, the compost is really making the big jump between um, not adding organic matter and adding organic matter. So that's one piece of uh, interesting understanding of what is adding what when we're doing multiple things, composting and cover cropping. However, interestingly, now we look at yield. So we got a lot of the organic matter from the compost, but, um, and we got some from the cover crops. But when we look at yield, we really see that benefit in the green, which is compost every year and cover crops every year. That's where the yield boost really jumped. And this is for lettuce on the central coast. Um, whereas every year compost or um, only cover crops every fourth year, you really don't see those benefits. And lastly, uh, looking at these benefits, how are, we, how are these practices impacting microbial biomass over time. So when we're only cover cropping every fourth year, it really hovers around zero or, or even losing microbial biomass. When we start composting every Tasty. year and adding uh, cover crops every fourth year, we do start to see this slow buildup. But once we add cover cropping every year, that's when we get this huge boost. So the, the um, cover crops are really important and different from compost in that they're really feeding the soil uh, and supporting this microbial buildup. Okay, so here's Eric Brennan. This is um, the researcher who, who did those studies. And so he basically in summary is that it's important to be doing annual cover crops or you can really increase the benefits by doing them annually. And this is gonna come from different types of cover crops. So rye or mustard or legumes, you'll be seeing this type of benefit. And a local um, farmer in our area, Durst, Jim Durst from Durst Organic Growers, he, uh, from an observational experiential point, has also found the same thing, that adding compost is an easy way to get that organic matter boost, but that the uh, cover crops have a slower, more cumulative benefit to the microbes and soil health. Okay, we're gonna jump into looking at these different cover crops. Um, essentially, we've got legumes, cereals, and brassicas, but I'll talk about a couple more as well. 
I wanted to point out uh, this resource, which is an NRCS um, document that goes through in a fair amount of detail all of these legumes. So they have them organized by cool season, warm season, broadleaf, grass. Um, so here's sort of the full list of what we think about in California. And then for each of those, they'll provide this type of a summary. You can have things like biomass, seeding rate, timing, um, and also some pest concerns or things to be aware of. So these are, this is a really excellent resource um, to, to know about and have in your back pocket. So when we think about legume cover crops, one of the first things we immediately think of is their contribution um, to nitrogen through their ability to take atmospheric nitrogen and fix it um, and provide it to plants. And nitrogen fixation is a symbiotic relationship between a bacterium and a plant and it occurs in the roots. So that's what these pictures are of. It's a root with the root nodules. And in these root nodules is where the bacteria are located. And when you slice open one of these root nodes, nodules, if it's pink, it's fixing nitrogen. If it's blue, it's not. And um, we usually think about peas, fava beans, and vetch as the legume uh, components. Um, each of these are a little bit different. The peas tend to be a little more slow growing. The fava beans um, have good, strong uh, vertical growth. Uh, a lot of people are concerned with them attracting aphids early in the season and being a source a, um, of aphids to the early vegetable crops. And vetch, this is, um, has excellent vining growth. They shade out weeds. And they're different from fava beans in that they tend to be more succulent, smaller stems, so they'll decompose more quickly. Whereas if you've grown fava beans, you know that they'll be this big root ball, um, which can be a concern for your following crop. So something to think about, and we'll talk more about that. So this idea of um, nitrogen fixation, important to recognize that these, uh, the plants will take up soil uh, nitrogen from the soil rather than fixing it in their nodules. So they'll take up any residual nitrogen first because this relationship with bacteria is um, energetically expensive. There's a cost, right? So there's a trade agreement between the plants and the bacteria. The bacteria are getting carbon from the plants and the, and the plants are getting nitrogen. So, um, so they'll be using that first. Um, but over time, they'll be able to contribute this back to um, the soil. So here's what a vetch only cover crop looks like. And this is planted in beds, right? You can see uh, the beds. So what are the benefits or sort of the co uh, components to a vetch cover crop? They tend to have a nice C to a low C to N ratio. And um, this helps in the amount of nitrogen you're gonna get in that first year. So um, a C to N ratio of 12 to 15 to one is gonna have a net positive release of nitrogen to the environment. So you're gonna get more of that N to the following crop as opposed to it being going into the soil bank for future years. It's quick to decompose. So if there's a quick turnaround time in the spring um, or if you're concerned with that, vetch is a nice one to go with. Um, there's different types of vetch. So sometimes, uh, you know, how do you make a decision between the different vetches? Um, the common vetch flowers a little bit earlier. So this can be good if you're planning on an earlier termination or hoping for an earlier termination. But of course, once you get flowers and seeds, then it can become a weed. So you can be conscientious of that. Purple vetch is also very common. Um, and hairy vetch um, or woolly pod vetch. Uh, one small thing to point out, this was research from my um, PhD, was that uh, legumes can be a uh, host for verticillium wilt, and they're not symptomatic, so they don't show that they have the pathogen in them. Um, but the pathogen can infect and reproduce on legume uh, plants. So this is a little chart showing the um, rating or ranking between different uh, vetch 
um, legume cover crops. So if you have Verticillium dahlia, common vetch was clearly a much better host than the other um, legume options. Um, if you have Verticillium wilt or Verticillium dahlia in your soil, choosing hairy vetch or bell bean will be a much safer bet for not increasing your uh, disease pathogen populations, but getting a legume into your field in order to get those other benefits. Inoculant. This is a really wonderful thing to consider. So these, um, this relationship between rhizobia and plant roots, legume roots, is um, uh, can be enhanced by selecting different types of inoculum. So um, this is some work by uh, Dr. Toby Kears from uh, the Netherlands. And what she has shown is uh, the difference in different types of rhizobial strains. And of course, rhizobia are naturally occurring in most soils. And so these relationships will form with your um, roots. However, they can um, take more carbon and give less nitrogen, or they can give more nitrogen and take less carbon. carbon. So that's what this um, uh, figure is showing. And this is called the sanctions hypothesis in which um, trying to select cooperative nitrogen sharing rhizobia. So on the bottom here, this is the axis in which the rhizobia are benefiting. So they're getting um, more carbon and there's gonna be more rhizobia on the plants. So they're thriving because they're taking more carbon as opposed to the plant really thriving through sealed seed yield. So um, what we see here is this is a, this is how um, a inoculum strain was selected and this is USDA strain uh, 110. And this is one in which the plant, the rhizobia had lower um, sort of success on a root and the plant had higher benefits. So that's something to think about um, when thinking about are you maximizing the potential for nitrogen fixation on your plant roots? How long these rhizobia stick around in the soil? Um, I can't tell you. Um, you know, we often hear anecdotally that once you inoculate it, they'll stick around. And I would suspect that that's true. But whether that's two years, 10 years, um, I'm not sure. So uh, worth considering looking at doing an inoculum, uh, inoculant if you uh, haven't done one in a while or haven't done one at all. Mustard is another type of um, cover crop option. And I would say that in the annual vegetable production type system, mustard has become less and less common for multiple reasons. Um, but one of them is that uh, they tend to be a um, excellent food source for a lot of vegetable pests. And we do not want these building up um, in our fields unnecessarily. Uh, they also produce less biomass. They don't fix nitrogen. They have a less extensive root system than cereal crops. Um, on the plus side, they do provide an early source of food for the pollinators. So that's a little bit about mustard. Here's some data showing the difference in biomass. So here's a rye cover crop, and this is, we'll just focus on the darker colored um, column and uh, the bar, and that would be for a February, March timeframe. So here's the biomass of rye, here's the biomass of a rye legume mix, and here's um, mustard. So it is significantly lower, although maybe not dramatically lower, that's for you to decide but you can see that there is less biomass. Okay, thinking about cereals, a whole range of cereals are used, oats, barley, rye, triticale. Um, they all have slightly different um, uh, characteristics, but uh, they're somewhat 
used interchangeably a lot. So thinking about the root balls, that's one of the challenges with growing um, cereal crops, especially longer in the season is that they're gonna have these large root balls, which can be uh, problematic for equipment uh, when you're trying to make your seed bed or trying to get decomposition in the springtime. Uh, how much time you have for that root ball to decompose. And then thinking about timing, if you're doing a later cover cropping, um, you know, a lot in California, around here, we rely on winter rains, and sometimes those don't come until December. It's starting to get cool and short days. So barley and rye can do a little bit better when we have these later um, planting days or germination times. Um, and also folks might sometimes consider even, should I put a cover crop in in January? And uh, this type of information could help you make that decision about what cereal crop might do best. And then of course there's the mixes, right? So here's an example of a locally available all legume cover crop mix. Here's an example of a mix that's the same one but it includes an oat component. And in the research I've done, um, adding those oats will increase the biomass it will also slightly increase the C to N ratio. So that will be um, a little bit lower N release in the short term, but with the biomass, you have more nitrogen total. So that will be going towards your organic matter buildup. So you'll just get it later. Um, but something to think about in terms of where you're counting on or when you're counting on getting that nitrogen. So cover crop mixes with a higher proportion of legumes, particularly when terminated before flowering, will release more of their end than later terminated cover crops with the grass heavy mix. So uh, that's essentially what I just um, mentioned. The tillage radish, this is, um, there's some interest and curiosity about tillage radish. It looks something like this. So it has these large tubers and then this, um, succulent growth on top and people are experimenting with um, using these in mixes and um, probably the biggest concern or challenge here is making sure that the that root can get chopped up and incorporated and or not interfere with your following planting so that would be something to consider there and then um, the other thing to add is that uh, in these cover crop trials at the Lockford Plant Materials Center, this is a USDA center in the Central Valley where they do all these cover crop trials. Um, one of the most important features to the um, daikon radish is the tremendous range in biomass by variety. So consider that when maybe you're either choosing your own variety to put in or you're looking at a mix that has a daikon radish in it. Here are the varieties selected. And if you look even just at the standard deviation down at the bottom here, right, the mean was 6,600 pounds of dry matter, but the standard deviation was 2,800. So it's a really huge range, right? You've got 3,000 pounds to 12,000 pounds. So that's a really important feature. Um, so just pay attention to the variety when you're looking at it. And of course that biomass directly translates to your nitrogen benefit. And if that's one of the main reasons we're growing this or even suppressing weeds, um, then you wanna pay attention to the variety. I forgot to mention that one of the reasons people um, are looking at daikon radish is for the, um, uh, the, the strength of that root system to break up compacted soil. And another reason is folks have generally been leaning towards this idea of diversifying their cover crop systems. Um, and that's one type of crop they've been looking towards. So I will um, send, a, I'll put a link in my website to this um, final study report, but this is a really um, in-depth document where that uh, table I showed you about daikon radish was showing, um, all these different varieties of vetches, uh, cereal crops, brassicas, and how they performed um, in terms of biomass, nitrogen, canopy cover, germination rate, all these different characteristics. So if you're interested in fine tuning your mix and your varieties, um, this is a great resource to, to be looking at.
So I'll put this link up onto my web page. So another couple of sort of things to consider um, and that I was curious about investigating a little bit more is what about uh, how can we choose cover crops to really try to provide pollen and nectar for those early um, populations of pollinators and maybe even benefit other beneficials? So this is a um, chart of the quality of pollen from different types of crops. And I have uh, blocked out in red some of the ones that we use in our region. So buckwheat, uh, so the CP is the crude protein and crude po protein is tightly correlated to, to the quality of a foraging pollen for um, honeybees. So that's often uh, used as a simple way to evaluate pollen quality. So in the top section, we have poor quality, middle, average, all the way up to excellent. So, um, you know, going beyond even cover crops, here are a few other crops in our area just to get a sense of where does their pollen quality fall. We've got sunflower, blueberry, um, maize, and buckwheat, citrus, and lavender in the poor quality, but they made the list. Um, average quality. So here's vetch. So that's interesting. Vetch is an average quality pollen and fava bean, two of our winter cover crops. Above average cover, uh, quality, almond, right? We hear about that being in the region we are of really high content of almond pollen. And also these clovers, and that's partially why they're encouraged to grow clovers in orchard um, cover crops is to get a healthy bee population um, going into the almond blossom and pear. And then lupin, very interesting here, right? This is an excellent quality lupin. So that's one of my questions to uh, the group and to the research community is the potential for integrating lupin into a cover crop mix. And then another one is um, Phacelia. So this is a native to California. This, um, this is a picture of this guide so you can read more about it here. But Facilia has been, um, you've seen it in some mixes these days. Um, it's an excellent um, uh, food source for bees. Uh, it's listed in the top 20 pollen producing flowers for honeybees and is highly attractive. It also provides a high quality nectar and pollen um, for these beneficial insect populations, including generalist predators, hoverflies, and parasitoids. And in California, it will bloom um, in March. You know, if we do a fall planting with it, uh, it's a competitive in terms of germination and against other crops and uh, can get established in a mix and producing flowers during that um, early spring season when we're trying to build up those beneficial insect populations. So this is kind of a neat option too to consider adding into a mix. So how do you choose? Um, it doesn't need to be that complicated, but uh, you know, sometimes when you get to the point of really making these fine changes, uh, you can look into all those details we just talked about. Um, really, they're all going to be excellent choices. But if you want to break it down, you can be thinking about the nitrogen contributions and whether you're focused on nitrogen or soil structure. Um, whether, you know, the timing of your activities following and how much of that cover crop needs to be degraded um, and accessible for your equipment. So what kind of trash does it leave and how much can you tolerate? So um, like the fava beans and the fava bean root balls are going to leave more larger, slower to decompose material than the vetch, for example. And do you have insect and disease concerns? So throughout the rest of the presentation, we're also going to be talking about different aspects that will parse out some of these um, different uh, cover crop options. Here's a cost um, breakdown. This is for um, from a couple of places locally, Lockwood, TSNL, or where a lot of folks get their um, seed from. And uh, here's a mix that's offered. So just to give you an idea. 
And here's what some of these look like. So this was 2019. We had a really wet winter, a lot of water. This is a cover crop mix. Um, this is the first week of April. Here's a vetch only mix. Same week in April, same winter. Here is a wheat crop, same winter, same week in April. When we look at the biomass um, of these different cover crops, they were basically all planted at the same time. Uh, even though the different planting dates, they all started with the same winter rain. So what you can basically learn here is that these three were legume only, and these two had oats in them legume oat mixes. And so you can see the difference in biomass when a cereal is added to a legume mix. And here's the um, wheat only. Okay, so bed preparation, we're kind of gonna breeze through some of these basic practices. Um, but essentially, bed preparation is gonna be the same as you would for a crop except you may not add your fertility that you would for a crop. And it might look something like two bed passes with a disc, a ring roller. Now this pre-irrigation uh, option is an interesting one that people do differently. Um, how you kind of want to manage your weeds and how much risk you feel like um, you have in terms of getting your crop established. So uh, in terms in terms of pre-irrigating, you could do this if you have a high weed pressure and you're concerned, you can do a pre-irrigation, um, do a cultivation pass, um, and then you also can then plant into moisture. Um, sometimes if this is done in October, that can be enough to get it up and get it going until the November rains, in which case you've gotten a head start and you're going to get significantly more biomass because of the not just a longer season, but October is a much warmer, longer day part of the season. So that's an interesting idea. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's hard to know what our November rains are going to be like, but sometimes it's a big rain. Sometimes it's a little rain. Sometimes it's two rains a week apart. Um, and this can be tricky to navigate when, um, relying solely on those rains to germinate the crop and then sustain it. So doing a pre-irrigation can get some moisture into the field to help um, buffer the unknowns around when and how much rain we're going to be getting. So uh, that's an interesting component to play around with. And I, I hear all sort of angles, pre-irrigation, two irrigations even, um, leading into a November rain. Uh, but the same goals are um, as you would for a crop need to be accomplished, right? Good seed soil contact. Um, some people are going to be adding compost in the fall, and it's not for the cover crop, it's really for the following um, crop. But your cover crop will use that compost nitrogen and put it into its biomass, and that will become available later. Um, so cover crops generally aren't fertilized, but they may get this unintentional fertility from a compost. Flat fields versus beds. This is a really interesting con, um, aspect also um, to play around with. What are the advantages of beds? Um, depending on your drainage situation, they can be better in beds. Um, the beds are then ready for spring. And if you have um, permanent drip, you may already have the irrigation in there if a winter irrigation is desired. Um, and we'll look at a couple uh, other reasons as well. But, um, and it um, also uses less seeds. So here's a little video I'm gonna show um, from Eric Brennan, who we saw earlier, talking about the beds. System and equipment that I'm going to be focusing on involves growing cover crops on beds in the same row spacing that we use for many of our vegetables. Now there's lots of potential advantages of growing cover crops on beds and I'll explain some of those after I show you the modified planter that we used to plant that. So this precision belt seeder works really well with round pelleted seeds and it's been the standard planter for most of the lettuce industry for more than 50 years. 
It's a great planter because it accurately spaces individual seeds within a row. But we don't need that level of accuracy with a cover crop, and it wouldn't make economic sense to pellet irregularly shaped cover crop seeds. The pelleting process is pretty expensive. So we removed the seed metering units, and we added these multi-purpose hoppers that deliver the seed right down to the bed where it's needed. Here we are planting the rye cover crop in two lines on four beds. And here's the field nine days after planting. Now the first potential advantage of cover cropping on beds is that we use about 60 to 70% less seed than with a standard planting arrangement. With a standard cover crop planted, say with a grain drill, there would be several more seed lines per unit area. And this is important to shade the soil quickly and suppress weeds. But with a bedded cover crop, we manage the weeds differently. So here we are rotary hoeing the cover crop to uproot weeds that aren't as deeply rooted as the cover crop. We then like to follow this with a standard vegetable cultivator about a week later. And this helps to take out remaining weeds that may be in the furrow bottoms or on the bed top and might have been missed by the rotary hoe. The cover crop then fills in the bed top and shades the furrows, giving us a nearly weed-free cover crop that's still extremely productive. Now, if the weather cooperates, we can take out several weed flushes during a single winter, and this really helps to reduce the weed seed bank. When the cover crop needs to be mowed, there are some real benefits to having it on beds rather than having it in a standard on-bedded arrangement. The wheel tracks of the tractor in a standard cover crop push down the cover crop in front of the mower and this can leave long on mowed strips through the field that are difficult to incorporate into the soil later. Now in contrast with a bedded cover crop the wheels run in the bare furrow bottoms and this allows us to cut the cover crop into smaller and more uniform pieces and also mow the cover crop close closer to the soil surface. Now another potential benefit to cover cropping on beds is that it allows us to control the growth of the taller cereal component in a legume cereal mixture. For example, with this rye veg mixture, the rye starts to flower before the veg and we can actually mow the rye seed heads off in the upper canopy to prevent them from setting viable seed and then let the veg vines get a little bit more light and grow a little longer to potentially fix more nitrogen. Let me now share some ideas of. All right, so uh, just some food for thought on cover cropping and beds as opposed to the flat field. I also really liked how he um, retrofitted a Stan Hay planter um, as an alternative to a grain drill, which is what most people um, will using. Um, so uh, now looking at seeding, this, this drill seeding is the most common and that's what this picture is of. Um, but that's a special piece of equipment that not everybody may have or be ready to invest in. Um, but some folks may have a Stan Hay planter or uh, other type of planter that can be um, adapted. I thought that, that was pretty great. Of course, uh, you can also broadcast. Um, there's push behind seeders, there's bait spreaders on an ATV. So getting creative on how you uh, get it out there is perfectly acceptable. What are the seeding rates? So the full range is 60 to 120 pounds per acre, um, whereas most will fall into this 80 to 100 pounds per acre. And how will you choose between these different seeding rates? Um, usually uh, you could consider a higher seeding rate if you have higher weed pressure. So you really are relying on a good dense stand if you're broadcast seeding, uh, you'll need more seed. Um, and depending on how you feel about your seed soil contact, you may wanna have a higher seeding rate. And there could be other reasons that you know of on your farm for potentially low germination. Uh, even things like maybe the cover crop seed is old. Um, so that's reasons, things to think about for your um, seeding rate. Here's just an example of a uh, earthway seeder um, that you can walk around the field and spin it and it shoots it out. I'm not going to play the video, but you can just Google it online and play it. Um, here's another one that's just a push behind and also just spins it out the same way. 
And these are, you know, that first one was like a $40 sprayer. Um, so thinking about our planting dates, here's a really great photo showing the difference in biomass production of different, of two different dates. So exactly, you know, neighboring field, same cover crop mix, obviously the same winter. Um, on the right hand side, you've got a January 15th planting date, which most folks wouldn't even consider a January date, but it's actually great to see how much you can get in that short of a time. And this is the November planting date. And when we look at the biomass, that's right here in the middle, 5,800 versus 3,500. So still pretty reasonable for a short time frame. This was a um, April uh, sampling date. Okay, so how to manage your cover crop. Basically, um, you know, continue to um, treat your cover crops as you would any other crop. You know, you're not going to pay to weed it, but hopefully you get an established uh, field that you don't have to weed. But you will still want to maintain the edges and consider irrigation. Why would people irrigate? Um, this could be for that pre-plant weed management, which I talked about, or helping to buffer this um, dry soil uncertainty about the rains. Um, another reason to would be to actually get more of that cover crop in October um, and get more of that biomass and maybe um, pay for it even more by the cost of that nitrogen. If we don't get rains by early December, this would be a time to consider, seriously consider irrigating because we start to get into a point at which the amount of biomass we're gonna get significantly decreases if that cover crop is not up by December, by early December. Um, so there's a timing issue here in terms of making the most of it. And when you're thinking about irrigation, thinking about how much have you already invested to get it established? How much are you counting on that end from that cover crop? There's a dollar value there that you can uh, estimate. Um, and is it worth it to you to try to irrigate? Terminating, uh, also pretty straightforward. There's a flail mow, there's a disc, and then the wait period. There's a lot of difference in how long people wait, a minimum of two weeks, and they sort of on the upper end, four to six weeks. Um, obviously, logistics often drive this decision, um, but once you do that waiting period, then you follow with the normal bed prep stages. Terminating, when to terminate. So. Um, when they're flowering, the leaf tissue has a three to four percent nitrogen content. And when we're thinking about nitrogen, we're thinking about that. Um, after flower, the, those crops start to invest that nitrogen into seed production. And so you see the nitrogen content going down and the carbon content going up. Of course, you can also terminate using uh, livestock, some grazing. So that's what this picture is of here. This is what I wanted to show you in terms of the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So this is the nitrogen on the x-axis and this on the y-axis, the vertical axis, is the amount of available nitrogen. And you can see that the amount of available nitrogen decreases when we have lower nitrogen percent. And when we have lower nitrogen percent, that's because our carbon is going up. So as our carbon to nitrogen ratio goes up, we see a decrease in availability. So that's just an image for you to uh, be thinking about when thinking about nitrogen in your cover crops. <clears throat> so challenges and considerations. Um, we've talked about a few of these and we'll get into them a little bit more. Um, so the higher seeding weight, if that's, you know, if weed suppression is your focus, get that higher seeding rate. Drilling is going to get a better establishment, which is going to be more competitive for your weeds. Earlier planting times is going to help uh, with the weed suppression. And doing a pre-irrigation, as you would for a crop potentially, cultivating that first flush of weeds and then planting your cover crop into it is a good option um, if this is really if you're really trying to enhance your weed suppression strategy. Timing, timing is a really big deal for folks uh, having success or failure 
with a cover crop. And this is because of on the spring end, on the back end of cover cropping, um, these planting windows of you know, your tomato crop or your pepper crop are really important and they can't be jeopardized for a cover crop. So uh, your cash crop still remains um, the driver for some of cover crop decisions. So as a generalization, many folks uh, will not cover crop for crops that are planted in March. And that's because there's too much risk in whether you can get into the field or not. Um, it can be too wet, not enough time to do all the passes you need to do and to give time for the cover crop to decompose. Um, you know, earlier in the wind, in the springtime, it's also gonna be cooler, uh, which can also be a slower decomposition process. So um, cover crops, a lot of folks think of cover crops for the uh, crops planted uh, really for the summer as opposed to the spring. Um, so again, focusing on the cash crop that's following this, uh, many people will not plant before these early plantings of tomatoes um, because it's too much risk in getting everything done and ready for these February, March tomato plantings. <clears throat> so some other crops, oops, sorry. Um, you know, maybe like carrots too, other types of spring crops, not doing it before them. Um, and let's say then, you know, if we have a March planting, well, what about if we terminated in January? Um, during one of those warm weeks in January, we can get in. Well, then you raise the question of whether you really got enough biomass from your cover crop to justify uh, the work and effort that went in. And I don't have the answer to that. There hasn't been a lot of research on that type of a, of a system, but that's something to be thinking about. Here's that same picture, pretty neat uh, difference there between uh, timing dates. <clears throat> So this timing component is one of the most challenging pieces for growers. Um, so uh, you can keep that in mind. Anticipating the spring scenario. Of course, um, we can't know what's going to happen. Can we anticipate? Uh, hard to say. But you can at least know where you're at in the moment and think about, given that situation, how much time do I have and need? Because when you do these passes to get in, cultivate, um, let the field dry out, et cetera, you know, you can somewhat take a stab at how much time you have, four, six weeks of uh, window. And what you're thinking about is uh, the rain and temperature, um, you know, cooler is gonna be slower decomposition, slower microbial activity, uh, too wet, um, for uh, <clears throat> uh, for your for your equipment to get in the biomass. Sometimes we have these, you know, wonderful winters with all this rain, and then you get this tremendous amount of biomass. That's going to take longer to decompose and a slower tillage pass, and maybe an extra pass or two. So, kind of playing all those factors in your mind to help you determine when's the right time for you to pull the plug and terminate your cover crop. It also can be hard to know how much moisture is in your field after you've terminated a cover crop. And of course that's gonna affect the next crop and some of the irrigation decisions that you're gonna make. Uh, knowing, do I have a foot of water? Is it moist three feet deep? So I encourage you to take a soil probe and uh, take a look. So, you know, this is a summary of our winter rains and really you can focus on the bottom because that's the, the summary. But you can see, and I know everyone knows, but sometimes it helps to visually see it. January, February, and March are when we get a lot of our rain. And that's why it becomes really hard to do cover crops that you terminate before April, because it's just still too wet and we're getting a lot of biomass still. So uh, you can see the number of days and the amount of rain in April just really slows down. But we're still getting good rain all through March. So that's you know, part of the timing component for these cover crops. 
So the residue, this is another thing to think about as far as what crop am I following with? Um, how am I sowing my next seed? What does that seed look like? Am I transplanting? So for fine seeded crops, it can be really hard to get into your field when there's a lot of residue. So um, keeping that in mind. These are probably the most common crops that follow a cover crop in our area. Of course, there's many, many more because a lot of growers grow 20, 30, 50 different types of crops. But um, you can sort of get the picture from this. Um, these are large seeded. They're a little bit more flexible on their planting dates. They're at, uh, put in as transplants, et cetera. Okay, any questions so far? I've kind of just been plowing ahead here. Okay, so we're gonna start looking at how much nitrogen is in the cover crop. Nitrogen is in the above ground biomass. While nitrogen actually occurs, the nitrogen fixation occurs in the roots. That nitrogen is taken by the plant and invested in the above ground biomass. So the roots themselves are not high in uh, the amount of nitrogen that they are contributing. Um, of course, there is some and roots are leaky. So there is nitrogen leaking out of those plants roots, but we're focused on the biomass. That's where more than 90% of all the nitrogen is gonna be in that biomass. And whether that biomass or that nitrogen came from residual soil nitrate or from the legumes, it doesn't matter. It's all in the above ground biomass and it's all the same kind of nitrogen. Research has shown that the amount of nitrogen that we will get following incorporation in that first season is gonna be four to 35% of the total N. And where does the rest of that go? It goes towards building your soil organic matter and your long-term soil fertility, right? So this is your simple picture where you have nitrogen fixation in the roots, it goes into the biomass, the crop residue gets incorporated, and then it becomes mineralized and grows into your plants. Also roots are decomposing and making nitrogen available. So how much becomes available? We'll just go step by step through this. So here we have bell beans, vetch, we have oats here and we have a mix and we have mustards. Uh, we can look at the tissue content. <clears throat> um, remember that the lower, the higher the nitrogen, the more that will be available. So we've got this Lana vetch at 4.7%, that's very high. Um, we've got these two cereal crops at 1.9, 1.7 on the lower side. So then we've got total N in the crop biomass. This is a factor of how much biomass there is and what's the tissue content um, in terms of nitrogen. So it's basically these two uh, multiplied. And you can see a range from 128 pounds per acre to 177 pounds per acre. So that's your total N in your cover crop biomass. And here's where we do the conversion to what is actually available this year. And so if we use that four to 35% availability, this is the type of nitrogen we're gonna get this year, six to 54 pounds of N, seven to 62 pounds of N per acre, et cetera. So you can see that um, we have that range of crops and we get this somewhat narrow range of nitrogen availability. Um, and you, you, know, you pick um, a number within that range based on a few factors, but the biggest driver is gonna be uh, this tissue end content. The higher it is, the more of, you know, closer to that 35% that you'll get. The lower tissue end content, the lower um, end available you'll get. So these, uh, rot series, these rye and oats are gonna be on the lower end of this range. Whereas this vetch, um, woolly pod vetch is gonna be on the higher end. 
And that can be a big difference, right, between six and 62 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Mm -hmm. And this um, figure is for manure. But the reason that I'm showing it is because it's this idea of cumulative nitrogen mineralization. So here's one, year one, of adding a manure. Here's year two, here's year three, here's year four. And this is the nitrogen mineralization in that first year. So you can see that you kind of get to this plateau where um, of availability and mineralization. And where is the rest of that going? That's going to your soil organic matter. So that's what this picture is of. This is time. And this is your nitrogen release rate. And you can see in the warm months, you get this big jump in soil organic matter release. And then it goes back down in um, October and beyond. So if you remember that first graph I showed you where you had the contributions from all the different end parts, that soil organic matter was huge. And so that's where this is coming from, this buildup over time. Now we can think about timing. When is the nitrogen available from our cover crop? And this is um, some data from our current research project um, at UC Davis, in which we actually track the end specifically come, coming from the cover crop planted before. And so if we look at you know, about 40 days after transplanting, so just over a month, maybe five weeks after transplanting, of all of the nitrogen that the tomatoes took up, about, let's say 15% of it came from the cover crop. And that's only gonna decrease over time. So you're gonna get that N, the most amount of N from that cover crop in the beginning of your crop growth. Maybe you've seen pictures like this where you have these like curves of nitrogen release rates. Well, here's your cover crop, right? This is four weeks. You can see how the cover crop is releasing that. Farm. And your nitrogen, your plant is taking it up right here. No. Let's see. Okay. Whether to incorporate or surface residue. The reason to incorporate is to get um, faster release of your nitrogen and to get more of the nitrogen. Um, and this is because of the uh, contact with the soil microbes that are facilitating this decomposition mineralization process in order to make that nitrogen available. Um, also, when it's left on the surface, um, some mo much more of it will be volatilized. So it will be lost to the system. Um, so something to consider uh, when you're thinking about surface versus incorporation. So to begin to summarize this um, nitrogen aspect, what's affecting the amount of nitrogen? It's the biomass of your cover crop. It's the end content. It's higher in legumes and it's higher in younger material. Your C to N ratio. It's going to increase as the material uh, in age increases, and it's going to lower. Um, it's going to make less less nitrogen will be available, and then incorporating um, less of it, more of it will be available when it's incorporated. I encourage folks to um, take samples. So this is how you can determine how much nitrogen you're actually getting from your cover crop. This is a picture of a quadrat, but basically you set some size, three by three is sufficient, that's what this is. And you cut your cover crop all the way down to the bottom in that space, and then you dry it, and then you weigh it. That will tell you your biomass. Take a sample of that dry material, send it to the lab, and for $20, you can find out your nitrogen and C to N ratio, and you know exactly how much carbon, uh, uh, how much nitrogen you're getting from your cover crop.
very simple, very exciting, and it helps you train your eye to be able to know uh, what it looks like out there. How can you look at the field, train your eye, and start to make educated guesses about how much nitrogen you have in your cover crop. So we started to do that um, in 2019 in the spring, trying to train our eye um, and look at these cover crops to start making these guesses on um, the nitrogen. A really robust cover crop. So uh, we looked at this earlier. This is the same data. We saw that the biomass of a legume only was quite a bit lower than legumes with the oats. The total N is also, um, it's gonna be higher in the legumes and lower when there's a cereal added. I hope that, I think that message is starting to be repeated, which is great. And then the C to N ratio, right? It's gonna be lower in the legumes and higher when there's a cereal um, mixed in. So when we translate that to the um, nitrogen availability this year, this is also using that four to 35%. Um, this is the type of range that we get. When we compare that um, the late planting, the regular planting of a November with the January planting, here's the kind of difference we can see. Um, we've got 5,800 versus 3,500. Um, you know, it has, it's going to have a higher total nitrogen percent in the younger one. So you're going to get more this year. You'll have a lower C to N. So you still get a fair amount um, of nitrogen from a uh, late planted cover crop. So I think that's pretty exciting and promising. What are the costs? Um, we're working on this cost study right now, but you don't have to look at detail, but basically we look at all the steps and the cost of seed and such. And um, we have an early estimate of about $178 per acre. Um, a local grower I spoke with estimated uh, his at $150 per acre. So uh, there's some consistency in uh, how much a cover crop is going to cost um, a grower considering all these activities. That's pretty. So what are some of the costs and trade-offs? Um, you know, remember that you are sacrificing a fall cash crop in exchange for investing in the following year's crop. So think about what you're investing for and is it worth it? You know, when there is a high value crop that you're growing, then that investment uh, can pay for itself. So cover cropping does cost more upfront. A farmer might not see the benefits for the first year or two. In five or 10 years, the benefits emerge and the costs even out over time. So this is one local grower's perspective um, on the cost benefit ratio. Again, this is that visual of our different nitrogen uh, sources, this one being the cover crop. So in summary, plant cover crops. Uh, they have so many benefits um, whether it's a monocrop, a legume cereal mix, a legume cereal daikon lupin facilia mix, they're all good and they're all going to do very well in our area, the ones that we've talked about. You're going to get these benefits of soil structure and nitrogen and early nectar and pollen, um, so do not worry about getting muddled in the details um, if you're new to this. Um, I think another lesson is to treat it like a crop. Um, do the same bed prep, um, manage it, consider irrigating it, terminate it, um, but give it the um, attention and um, treatment like a crop and uh, it will increase the success and the ease of doing this. Oops. Um, but also stay focused on your following cash crop. 
um, that you know your farm operation, your farm business is uh, central to this. So focus on what's going after it and how can you make choices about your cover crop to best support that following crop. Some things to play with, right? Irrigation, can you get it going early and really increase your biomass? Can you do a pre-irrigation to get the weeds under control? Can you supplement during the winter, um, a low winter or low water winter um, to ensure you're getting the biomass that you're maybe counting on? Um, think about some other crops to mix in if you're interested in exploring. Can you play with the timing of sowing? October, November, December, January. Uh, you know, November and getting that November rain is the typical planting window for the cover crops. Beds versus flat field. And adding your legume seed inoculant. So that's what I have for you today. I'm uh, impressed I got done by 1.10. Um, so, you know, my hope was to have this be like a lunchtime session. Um, so uh, I would love to hear any questions or conversation. I welcome folks to share their own experience. Um, but uh, if I want to open up the floor to all of you. Um, so thank you for um, participating, for attending. And um, I will put this presentation and some of the resources that I talked about on my website for you to access. And um, of course, you can always reach out to me um, with any other questions. So, uh, so thank you. And uh, please, uh, anyone have any questions or comments they want to uh, bring to the group? I have a question, Margaret. Uh, mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is Jim from the UC Davis Student Farm. Hi, Jim. Uh, I was hi. I was really interested in Eric's uh, Stan Hay uh, yeah. planter setup. Do you know uh, if he shares the design on that, or uh, if there's any way to find out how to set that up? Because we've got a Stan Hay, we can modify that way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I would just email him directly. Okay. Yeah, you can find him easily. Just Google his name, USDA. He's um, and you can tell him you saw his video. He's uh, very accessible. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. really uh, interested in experimenting with the daikon on some of our compacted ground. Great, great. Yeah, I'd love to come out and see uh, any uh, retrofitting you do and, and daikon that you might plant. Yeah, I'll keep you posted. Yeah, great. Margaret, this is David. Can I ask a couple of compost okay. questions? Okay. Um, first of all, um, just wondering about the quality of compost, you're getting commercial compost, even if organic, you know, I know that the CDN ratios are all over the place and whether you've looked at sort of compost quality in terms of eventual nitrogen production and, um, um, yeah, just sort of the, 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 the quality of what you're getting out of the cover crop and then Secondly, um, when to apply the compost, whether pre-planting of the cover crop or after we've mowed and incorporated that prior to our cash crop planting, um, yeah. if that's when we should be putting in the, the um, compost. Yeah. Um, a, a decision as far as timing um, that's purely logistical is uh, totally reasonable. So do you want to do it in the fall because it's one step done and um, you're worried about all the springtime activities, that's a really solid reason to do it in the fall. When we think about it from a nitrogen standpoint, um, you know, we kind of have three categorical options in our area, yard trimmings, manure, and a mix. And the yard trimmings material is gonna be higher carbon, lower nitrogen, and the manure-based ones are gonna be higher nitrogen, lower C to N, and then the mixes are truly in between. And in our research, what we have found is that the yard trimmings compost, when applied prior to the planting, frequently ties up nitrogen or contributes zero, 
nitrogen to that mm -hmm. crop following. And for that okay. reason, um, if you're applying the compost, hoping for or needing that nitrogen, I would not choose a yard trimmings one right before planting. Um, and yep. that could be a reason to do a yard trimmings compost in the fall, give it more time for all the mineralization and, you know, essentially kicking nitrogen out of your soil bank um, as uh -huh. a way to get the nitrogen. The manure composts are much, with a higher nitrogen and a lower C to N ratio, they're gonna be able to provide more nitrogen immediately following application. So mm -hmm. if you're counting on that nitrogen in the springtime and you're doing a spring application, the manure-based composts are gonna give more of that in the short, immediate term. Um, and like I said, those mixes, they really are in between. Um, so yeah. in our research, you know, the yard trimmings was right around zero. The manure base, like poultry manure ones, were at 35% of the total N, and the mixes mm. were right in between at like 17%. So yeah. depending on what you need and what time frame you're wanting that N in could help drive that decision. Okay, good, that's helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess one more thing, you know, when you put it into the fall, any that becomes available in the short term, your cover crops will take and put in the biomass. So then you'll be getting it in the biomass of the cover crop, you know, some amount mm -hmm. of it in the short term. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Hi, Margaret, I had a question. Hi, Karine. Um, thanks for good talk. Hi, Karine. Hi, David. <laughs> um, yeah, th yeah, thanks for everything. Uh, I guess what I just wanted to make sure I got um, down pat was that those cover crop mixes or cover crops where you have the higher C to N ratio, like in the long term, those are the ones that are going to help your soil the most. Um, the lower C to N ratio ones, those are just going to be beneficial for your, like, if you're planting and want that nitrogen available, like, right away. Is that right? Kind of. I would think more about the biomass in a way. Yeah. Um, you know, biomass is where we're getting the material back into the soil. And then the C to N ratio will help you determine how much is available in the short term versus the long term. Mm -hmm. okay. The biomass component is a really big one. Yeah. Yeah. But like yeah. That, that, that's going to go to your microbes in the long run and to your soil health in the long run. So um yep. yeah just if you're looking building at long of organic mm -hmm. matter mm -hmm. okay yeah exactly so you will get it eventually yes you'll get it eventually yes exactly great All right, any other questions or comments out there? Okay, like a, an auction, going once, going twice. <laughs> Margaret, this is Rachel. So that was a really super great uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it and uh, Talking, um, and uh, I was just wondering. So, so we have uh, we have tomato ground and um, uh, for processing tomatoes. And I was talking to Dave, and, and we're looking at uh, sort of trying to decide uh, whether to uh, to do a uh, like a, a cover crop, um, maybe either mustard um, or or maybe uh, vetch. So two things: putting organic matter in and maybe opening up the soils. And do you have any? Any thoughts on that in terms of uh, which one, what, like what cover crop would be good for you know, opening the soil, organic matter, and um, we have alkali spots out there too, and we put compost out there last year, and that really, really helped the uh, tomato growth in those uh, those alkali spots. It was pretty neat how how that compost can really help the uh, health of the plants. Yeah, yeah, the compost is amazing uh, as a buffer, pH buffer. Um, I'm fine. How are you? I didn't know if you had uh, thoughts on that. Good. Yeah. 
Um, so when would you want to terminate if you're doing tomatoes? Uh, so usually if I think we put in tomatoes in uh, like April is normally when when we'll plant uh, and uh, not not March. So uh, so it'd probably be sometime maybe mid April, April 15th or so. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. Well, um, I mean, you know better than I do the risks of mustards with some of the insect pests. Right, with especially, yeah, because mustard is a uh, significant host for bugs um, and, uh, and ligus bugs, so good point there, and brigada bug too, right? Yeah, yeah, um, and, and even others like, uh, yeah, the uh, flea beetles, we had, uh, anyway, it always seems like mustard is the cause. It um, is, um, mustard and radish and malva are really, really uh, key problem hosts <laughs> for state yeah. bugs algas and cucumber beetles and flea beetles that's for sure so i would be thinking about that um and the concern with that with your uh, tomato crop following right right and, Good. yeah i think it is still a tight turnaround for the mid-april planting because you would want to be getting in there in early march to maybe start you know or mid-march to start doing some of those um mow downs so choosing something that would be quick to decompose like the two that you've chosen um, the vetch and the mustard, I think, are good, are right. good options. Um, you know, for the nitrogen, you're going to get more of that from the vetch, seeing mm -hmm. that it can um, do the fixation, and you're going to get more biomass from the from the vetch cover crop. Right, right. It's also going to do a better job at shading out the winter weeds, depending on your type of stand. But you know, the vining nature of it is going to do a great job shading out whereas mustard you would really have to be counting on getting a really good stand to get the same amount of soil cover that you might be wanting for a um for weed suppression or, or other purposes so those are a few things that go through my mind oh we, did we lose you i know rachel's i'm wrong. here sorry yeah that just uh, oh, another call came in so yeah so thank you yeah that's really helpful i, I really love that you brought up the uh, reminder about mustard and stink bugs and cucumber beetles and all forgot bug and such so thank you yeah thanks rachel safe drive margaret could i ask another question sort of following rachel's about seasonality um you know, I'm doing grains, and so my timing's not quite right for most of these. I'm really, yeah. you know, I would like to be planting ideally in sort of January, no, no further than late January if possible, which means that, you know, I need to be terminating and incorporating what, you know, beginning of January, um, if weather permits. And I just put in, like, buckwheat and um, uh, cowpea, where I'm about to put in some cowpeas today even, um, it's kind of a shoulder season, you know, not quite summer, not quite fall, winter cover yeah. crop, something quick. Any other recommendations for something I could be getting in, you know, starting say August yeah. and getting enough biomass for it to make sense by end of December? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and I can't say I have a great answer um, or a really um, informed answer, but some things that come to mind. Um, so cowpeas could be a great option. Yeah. Um, you know, I've heard locals say August 15th as sort of the last date. Um, so if you can get it in, you know, the first two weeks of August, cowpea okay. would be excellent. Um, you'll get okay. a ton of biomass and um, great nitrogen fixation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, Fun. thinking about the, the bees, um, so the spring and the fall are the times when the bees really are looking for nectar and can sometimes be yeah. short on it. And um, for that reason, the buckwheat you mentioned can be great because it can yeah. provide quick um flowers and sources of pollen nectar for the for the bees and maybe other pollinators and beneficials as well mm -hmm. um so from that i've actually got that in some cereal rye right now too i realized that 
I wasn't able to terminate, so that's just reseeded in the field, but that's coming up pretty strong that I'm irrigating right now. So I'll yeah. terminate that cereal rye. Yeah. yeah, I'll be interested to see what you learn from this this planting that you just did. Yeah, like, likewise. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I guess, and then, as long, long as I have you. Other question about termination. Um, do you know of anybody that is um, terminating by crimping or trying to maintain the cover crop as some kind of green mulch, you know, for no-till planting, drilling into that rather than incorporating it fully into the soil and whether you get any benefits out of that and what are the risks of it reseeding? Yeah, again, not, I don't have a lot of information on it personally. Um, it's definitely experimental. Um, and so, there's a lot of unknown success, few successes, lots of failures is kind of where mm. we're at with it. Um, you know, the folks in your own neighborhood at Full Belly are experimenting a lot yeah. with this. And it has not been easy. Yeah. Um, and uh, the <clears throat> Bill Foster in Hollister has some videos you can watch. Okay. Um, and you know you can sort of see what he's doing and what some of that equipment looks like. Um, but I think the main challenges are um, things uh, continuing to grow beyond uh -huh. you, know, you mow it and then they keep growing and that would be your grasses. Um, so yeah. that can be a problem in terms of competition. For cereals especially, yeah. Yeah, they, they're gonna start growing. You may need to mow again um, or you don't, or you can't get in there because your crop is too big. So that can be a juggling act. <clears throat> um, the roots uh, can be a problem. So depending on how you're going to transplant into it or what you're going to transplant into it, because when you have all yeah. these roots in there, um, they can be hard to work around. Um, mm -hmm. And so your actual planting shoe or planting tool um, may have trouble or you know you need to look at whether what you have can handle okay, those root balls yeah yeah um you know some people have like modified so that you like have a cultivation that's only this wide you know a strip till basically mm -hmm. um yeah instead of the whole bed um eric brennan has some funny videos he's really uh, you know uh creative and uh, and actually, if we had continued on the video we were watching, I think. Anyway, he has a thing mm -hmm. that he devised to like mow the whole thing and deposit everything into the furrows and then strip till uh -huh. um, uh -huh. as a way to deal with all the biomass. Um, you know, the the challenge with I think one of the biggest challenges with the strip till is the nitrogen competition, actually. Um, so mm -hmm. it appears that when all this residue gets left on the surface and not incorporated and mineralized right away, the delay or the amount of time it takes to work through it becomes very, very long. And it becomes a tremendous mm -hmm. source of competition for nitrogen for your main crop. And so nitrogen mm -hmm. deficiency is one of the bigger challenges that folks are seeing with uh, leaving the residue on top. And so okay. actually having to increase the nitrogen supplementation is one of the consequences or one of the ways to deal with it. It which is kind of, you know, it ironic. Kind of a different trade off. <laughs> yeah. It's a different, you know, effect depending on what your goals yeah. are. Um, but okay. yeah, the nitrogen scenario is really is one of the main uh, challenges, other than, you know, actually physically getting in there, getting your crop in the ground and established. Yeah. Yeah. So Good. that's a little bit of what I've uh, learned about the no-till, strip-till, or leaving it on the surface. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, how the like sun happened? Uh, I've worked a little bit with cowpeas, but more for a uh, crop. And there's uh, some neat new varieties coming out through UC Riverside that have. Uh, resistance to the uh, cowpea aphids. So it's pretty exciting with uh, the new varieties coming out as possible cover crops. But what about um, what about sun hemp? How is that as a summer cover crop? Yeah, I mean, great. Sun hemp, 
um, and Sespania. Um, these are these are all great. Um, I think the main question was, I don't know how they do, you know, in the fall, as opposed to, I think of them more in like June, July, August, September, as opposed to August, September, October, November. So for me, that's an unclear window is what is, how do these do in more like a fall condition? Um, and is there enough warmth in August, September to yeah, get them biomass? Yeah, probably not because they're summer. They're summer lovers. Same with that cowpea. So you're right. So it wouldn't would not be for fall. Yeah, I, I don't know. It would be worth experimenting potentially. I, I tried to order some sun hemp uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they'd already sent every through. I think through TSNL, and they'd already sent everything back to the warehouse. So they're clearly not not right, they have to get not it. pushing it for September planning. Yeah. Right, you'd have to order it in the spring if you want to try yeah. it. Yeah. <clears throat> that push really early alfalfa plantings, you know, I mean, like, you know, August, uh, September, because then it's a perennial, and if you can really get it started in the fall, then it'll do really well. So sometimes I wonder also now about uh, some of these cover crops, you know, what happens if you really get them going say as soon as you harvest a uh, tomato crop say in the uh, in August and then get a cover crop right there and get it up and really going but I guess the problem is you know just uh, trying to get it uh, ready for uh, uh, for plant early planting and it just depends on if, you know the year whether it's a wet year or dry year it's challenging yeah yeah and I mean kind of like you said there you know I think there, there's an interest in exploring this little window of end of tomato harvest and I think before the soil gets too wet. <laughs> mm -hmm. So can you do like a two month cover crop between September, yeah. October um, so that come November with that first rain you could incorporate and get your beds ready for the, uh, the tomatoes going in in February, March, April. Yeah, which would be a really neat window to, uh, to figure out to get a little cover crop in, some soil cover and some nitrogen and other soil health benefits. Yeah. All right, any more uh, questions? Any more things to bring to the table? Oh, it is one twenty. I, I, don't, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say we're doing a short window cover crop ahead of a wheat uh, planting if you want to come and take a look at it at some point. We did oh. it with cowpeas. You did it with cowpeas, That's and when student. did you get them in? Uh, we put them in the first week in September. Oh, okay, great. Who, who yeah. is this? Oh, sorry, this is Jim from the student farm. Okay, I thought so, but you also have another- Jim, I'll be by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can come take a look. They're pretty small right now, but they're up and going, so we'll see how, how it works out. But that was- cool. uh, a request by the researcher that she wanted to cut the crop ahead of her planting. Yeah. Um, I'm so going to put an acre in today, so we'll see if I, it's still too late. Yeah. Well, maybe we can come get a biomass sample and see what you got. Yes. And we've also undersown it to some clovers, which was another researcher's experiment. So you can come take a look. Okay. Yeah. You're going you're gonna to take it out when, maybe? Uh, probably end of October. Okay. Cool. Well, that'll be fun to see how it does. Yeah. yeah. I mean, of course, David, we had an odd August, September with all the smoke. Um, and, I'm know, thinking the heat there. more than the smoke. Well, both, yeah. Uh, but in terms of, you know, diffusing some of the light, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how much with the with the light sensitivity versus temperature sensitivity or if it's just the daylight hours that are making yeah. or the signal for, for for these plants yeah great well it's 1 30. So be interesting to see. yeah great well it's 1 30 so i'll bring this meeting to an end i really appreciate everyone's conversation and questions and discussion here it's always a big part of the enjoyment of these things. So um, I wish everyone luck, stay in touch, uh, enjoy the clean air, and I'll <laughs> see you again soon. <laughs>